Good evening, everyone. Y un bienvenidos especial a todos los que hablan español. My name is Corinne MacDonald, and together with my husband, Joe, um, I founded the John Paul II Project. And we are so excited to welcome you to this special live panel discussion. And I invite you with little clapping hand emojis virtually to welcome our guests, Jason Everett, Sister Gaudia, and Dr. Swafford. How are you guys doing tonight? Doing great. Thank you for having us on. Yes, yes thank you. Yeah, we're so excited to have you. And, you know, it is the vigil of John Paul II's 100 year birthday. And anybody, Sister, you were telling us before about how you were celebrating in the convent. <laughs> yeah, we started celebration already by this uh, simply having a dessert after dinner already um, to celebrate John Paul, kind of kremovka, what, whatever we could do here in America, whatever ingredients we had to make a kremovka, so this famous papal cake, which he used to eat to celebrate his exams, still living in Vadovice. So yeah, we ate that and we uh, rejoiced with his birthday. That's awesome. Yeah, actually, I am not much of a baker, as any of our alumni who lived with us in Poland can tell you, I'm more of a cook. But I did try to make this as well. <laughs> and it didn't look anything like traditional kremovka, but it was yummy. <laughs> so <laughs> it passed, the, it has, yeah. passed the family test. So it was good. We're doing a little, if anybody follows us on social media, we're doing a little kremovka challenge. And that's another way to win uh, Jason's book on John Paul II as well. So you have until tomorrow night if you want to take a take a hack at it. It's not too hard. But we thought more than Kremovka, um, there would be no better way to honor St. John Paul II than by challenging and building up and encouraging young people to really follow in his example and to carry on the torch. Um, you know, this is no minor task considering that he was one of the most influential people in the 20th century and arguably in the entire church history. So we've asked our guest panelists some bold questions. Uh, and just as in logistical uh, notice here, uh, you are definitely invited and highly encouraged to ask questions. So in the bottom panel of your screen of the, of the Zoom window, you'll see a little Q&A button so you can click that and type your questions there, and then we'll select some, uh, and we'll let you know that you are selected. And when your, your turn is up to ask the question, you can actually ask them, we turn your microphone on. Don't worry, we don't turn your video on. So if you're there watching in your unicorn pajama set, you can stay that way and no one will know. So uh, you'll just be able to, to ask the question to directly to the speakers, and it can be an open question or to one speaker in particular. Um, and and you'll have, we'll have multiple opportunities for that as well. So feel free at any time to type in your questions. And then if you have a tech question, there's a little chat button, so you can put something in there as well, and we'll try to help you out. Uh, so without any further ado, oh, and one last thing as well. At the end of this little session, there is going to be a survey and if you are interested in winning the little mini library of five publications that you can choose out of about eight, uh, fill that out and you can pick the books that you want and we'll send those to you. So we'll do that at the end. Um, but now we'll get into hearing from our speakers that have generously given their time uh, with this bold question. And I think we'll start from hearing uh, from Dr. Swafford about what you think should be the number one goal for young people this year. Hmm. Number one goal. Uh, you know, if I, just two things really come to mind. Um, one, find some friends that are really running the direction you want to run in. Uh, there's a saying, if I want to know who you are, if I want to see your future, show me your friends. Uh, and we talk about virtuous friendship. It, it's, it's always a, it's about something. It's not just people running at each other, but it's especially when you gather for a transcendent good, uh, especially in love of Jesus Christ, that, that's just transformative. And to do that in conjunction with prayer, deep prayer, liturgical prayer, sacramental prayer, to really get to know Jesus, and not just stand on the sidelines, uh, but to, to be building each other up in that way, 
I look at Jump All Seconds Life and there's so many examples where he was a part of that or whether he <clears throat> really helped foster and form that. And I think, Karen, that's what's so transformative about his life, what he did. Uh, when he gathered young people together, it wasn't just to have fun. They really met Jesus. They really entered into prayer in a deep and profound way. And that's really what... Um, perseveres through the vicissitudes of history, whether it's the Nazi occupation, communism, what have you. And, and to this day, we are reaping this fruit of this incredible saint, incredible man. So prayer and good friendships, uh, communities form, gathered around a transcendent good. Okay, awesome. Yeah, I, you know, you're making me think of questions. I'm sure our participants have questions too, but Sister Gaudi, how would you answer that question for number one goal for young people? Yeah. Definitely the Holy Spirit is working because I didn't know Dr. Swafford's answer before coming to this meeting and <laughs> my answer is almost the same. So number one goal uh, for young people, uh, which I found, find as the most important, should be deepening the friendship with God and with other people. And Further on, I can say more about it, but definitely deepening the friendships. And I believe that this time of lockdown now also showed us the, the great need of, of friendships and how people are getting more and more depressed because they are isolated. They are getting very anxious because they have no contact with other people. And not this online contact is not enough. Like they've been into that online contact uh, all the the time through um, before the lockdown, uh, but but maybe not all the time through. That was like a big major part of their lives, right? Because we always saw young people, uh, not only young people, but many people just stick to their phones even as they are walking on the, the sidewalks. But now they have no other choice. They have only the phone, only the computer screen, and that's really uh, causing serious issues. Uh, so from some of my friends who work in, in pharmacy industry or something, I have heard that really the antidepressants are gone. There's no access to, wow. to serious you know, medicine because people are just swallowing them uh, with whole fists, you know, if I can say so. Uh, please forgive me. I'm Polish. Um, I'm justified. I don't know how to express some things in English. But I hope even using my hands, you will somehow understand what I'm trying to convey. So the situation is serious. We need deeper friendships, first with God and then with other people. Uh, or at the same time, they, they intertwine, they go together. Jason, what, what would you um, what would you add or what would you say? I think it's interesting that, you know, the, the three of us didn't have any time to connect with each other and say what our answers would be to these things, but we each had time to think about it and came up with something very similar for me. I think if the Holy Father could ask the young people and the old people to focus on one thing this year, it would be to listen to the voice of the Father. Um, in my reading of the New Testament, it seems to me that God the Father gives lots of commands in the Old Testament but he actually only gives one single command throughout the entire entirety of the New Testament. Now, it's kind of unfortunate we have a doctor of biblical studies on the program, so if I'm wrong, <laughs> he might call me out on this, so you can just maybe mute his mic for the next minute. But uh, from what I can tell, God the Father only tells us to do one single thing in the entire New Testament, and that's, this is my beloved son, listen to him. It's the only command of the Father in the New Testament, listen. And so I think that's what John Paul would, second, would say to us, not first do and go and evangelize and catechize and no, first be, be still, you know, and, and listen. And John Paul II called us not just like make time for prayer, but he actually called us like love contemplation to invite us to have deep prayer lives. I remember at the university where I went, Franciscan University of Steubenville, we had a fantastic president who's since gone on to his reward named Father Mike Scanlon. And Father Mike would wake up in the morning and he would pray for four hours before he did any work. In fact, he would not begin work each day until he knew exactly what the Father wanted him to do. And all his productivity came from that contemplation. And so I think if the Holy Father would call us to do anything, it's not first to go out, but to go in, to be still, and to listen. Okay, so I'm thinking of, you know, some of 
the young people that, for example, came abroad with us and the young people that I've worked with. I mean, how do you do that? I mean, some of these people already have prayer lives, so to speak. So where is sometimes that obstacle? Maybe we can start with that of, okay, well, I do pray to God. I am trying to live out my faith here. So what do I need to change? Why am I not hearing the father? Well, I almost compare it to uh, if you take a glass of water and you just stir it around and then just sit it down, the water wouldn't stop spinning for a while. It takes a, a bit of time to become still. And likewise, if our days are full of music and noise and apps and screens and this and that, and then we sit down for two minutes, we try to listen, our brains are still stirring and we give up. Well, I didn't get anything out of that and we're gone. It's like we need to create stillness in our lives outside of our prayer times, that we need to create more quiet in our life and more patience in our prayer times. I remember as Mother Teresa, a journalist, once asked her, he's like, when you pray to God, you know, what does God, you know, what do you say to God? And she said, nothing. I just listen. And intrigued by that reply, he said, okay, well, what does God say to you? And she said, nothing. He just listens. Now, it's, it's, it's reasonable to ask what they're listening to if nobody is talking, but I think when two people are deeply in love, words aren't always necessary. And so prayer is primarily the work of God and our souls, not primarily the work of us doing all this hard work of contemplation, then we get our fruit. We need to let be still and realize that prayer is primarily an act of receptivity. And just because I don't have any overwhelming spiritual feelings, it doesn't mean that God is not at work. It doesn't mean that he's not close to us. The measure of how close we are to God is not the intensity of our religious experiences, but just the willingness to conform our hearts to his heart and be still. And it's almost like, you know, someone who works out in the sun, over time, their skin just looks leathery and dark because he's been out there all the time. It's the same in prayer. When you get marinated in prayer over the years, it just becomes evident. And so the fruit of prayer is usually not experienced in prayer, but rather in persevering in prayer. If I, okay. I may add something. Yes, yeah, sister, go ahead. Ex this is exactly what Jesus says in the diary uh, when he says that his voice is very silent and only recollected souls can hear it. So in the diary of St. Faustina, of course. Um, so life of recollection is super important if we want to hear Jesus' voice. Yeah, Karen, if I could just jump in, this is beautiful. Um, one of the things I do in one of my, my Christian moral life classes, the students have to have a 48-hour media fast, and they have to write a reflection on it. And they always kind of complain at first, I can't believe you're going to make me do this. But then con consistently, I get reduced anxiety, better sleep, better conversations, more productive. Uh, so I, I think, I, as Sister said and, and Jason said, I mean, what are we letting in downstream, right? What's coming in downstream? And, and is there enough stillness in our heart and mind to even enter into prayer? And the other thing, too, I'd say I've seen this. Uh, I, I think this has always been part of the human condition, but I've seen it, I think, an uptick recently. Do, do our young people really believe in the power of grace? Do the, and I, I think for all of us, to be totally honest with you, the hardest thing it, it, for us to really to believe is not the Trinity, is not the sexual teachings. It's that God, the eternal creator of the universe, loves me that much. I, I, I see it in students a lot. that They don't really, the, the deep shame, the past, the power. I mean, think about what we say before we receive the Blessed Sacrament. I am not worthy to, that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. No, I'm not worthy, but our Lord makes us worthy. Do they, do they really believe in the power of grace to make us not just servants or creatures, but sons and daughters of the Father, that such that, such that the Father looked down upon us and love us as he loves his only begotten Son? Moral perfection can't earn one drop of that. Do we believe that? Yeah, and we're definitely not going to believe that if we don't have this relationship this living relationship with god um we'll just get drowned by drowned out by everything else by all the rest of the noise so that's a great a great question to ask um you know and i'm i'm thinking too you know everybody kind of touched upon all the noise and touched upon media and while media is great i mean we can do things like this uh just on a practical note <laughs> Any of this, our alumni watching this know I'm from Jersey, so I like to get very real, you know, no sugar coating anything. But on a practical note, what does that look like? Like, what does that look like not being 
addicted to media or having a little bit of quiet in my life. And maybe that's going to be different for a high school to a young professional to um, someone who's married with kids. But can anybody paint a little bit of a picture of developing this interior life, what this actually looks like? I remember a friend of mine, he said for Lent, he said, what I like to do is turn off all noise in the car. Uh, so n even praise and worship, uh, even Christian podcasts, nothing but silence. And he said, Jason, you should try that. And I tried it when he recommended it maybe 15 years ago, and I do it every single Lent. And it's amazing because at the beginning, you get in the car and your hand just reaches for noise. And then you're like, oh, no, no, remember it's Lent. And then you start driving. Ten seconds later, you're reaching again. It's like, why do I need noise? Why do I need input, input, input? But by the end of those 40 days, like Dr. Swafford said, more productivity, more peace, more clarity, uh, just, just such a, a better state of mind. And so we have to choose to make time for silence. You have to carve it out because the world is so noisy. And if you, if you want to be looking at a screen first thing in the morning or last thing at night, okay, make it the liturgy of the hours. Get a good prayer app like Universalis or Hollow and, and do some Lexio Divina when you wake up or before you go to bed. So that way, the bookends of your day is prayer. And if you need a screen to do that, fine. But just make sure you're at least beginning and ending the day in prayer and making some room for silence in between. Um, anybody else want to add? Well, I just think that's so well said. I, sister, you're probably poised to answer this in the best way. I, I just think of, of sloth, the Achadian. I think of the, the uh, you know, which is defined by like an Aquinas, a sorrow at the difficult and spiritual good, the kind of um, spiritual malaise that we have. And then what happens, we, we're kind of idle and bored and restless and unfulfilled. And so we reach for a phone, we reach for comfort food. It could be pornography. It could be just the, and the ancient monks will say, stay in yourself, just stay in yourself. So I would say at least one thing to reflect on is, am I doing any of this intentionally? Or am I just kind of filling time? Uh, what if you just carve out like a half hour? We're going to check your phone at night. That would be better than, than doing it every you know, seven minutes just for no reason at all. Um, and, and this is, I'm talking to myself too. And, and this is, I mean, but I just, why do that? Because you're trying to avoid what you should be doing. Well, why just fill it? Do it intentionally at the very least. Yeah. You know, like um, many a times during prayer, we will not hear anything or nothing special will happen. Like you will, in a sense, like waste your time, right? But then God speaks in between. Like he gives those lights and those words on, on those ideas and those consolations and understanding in between, like in between your prayer, your cooking, your work, your, um, as you walk to the car, in those less unexpected expected moments. I mean, St. Faustina, come on, she had first revelation, first time she saw Jesus, it was on the party. It was during her dance with a boy, it wasn't in the church. So, but she prayed and then he came to her during a dance, right? So uh, we must always be like, have our eyes open and be aware of our here and now, where am I, what's happening in my life? because God speaks in between. That's why it's super important for what you uh, just said, not to check the phone every seven minutes for no reason at all, but to have some kind of rhythm that I will stick to, let's say before some actions that I do, or before work I, I check the phone or after the work I check the phone, but not to do it without reflection. Uh, even if I do it often, then just think why, why, and to get to know myself better through this, like why do I need this continuous stimulation? What am I really missing? Why do I search for, what am I searching for in the phone? Because the answer can be a revelation, a, a self-knowledge revelation for us. Yeah, that's so right. There's um, actually, there are a number of psychologists and um, communication specialists who speak to this, I mean, from a secular viewpoint, having nothing to do with trying to get holy, but just in being more human. And uh, we have on our book list for our staff formation, uh, this book by an author called Sherry Turkle, uh, Reclaiming Conversation. And it is awesome, it goes into all of this and just the effects that we have and the importance of ordering this, um, this, this aspect of our lives. Uh, and then also I'm just thinking of, an, of another book that we have, which is really good about the importance of 
the interior life called soul of the apostolate um which is something that that we have our our staff read as well and you can read it and reread it again um because without having this <laughs> relationship with god then you don't have lights to be ordered in your day you know you won't be able to hear the lord speak to you in those little moments so um you know we have a really good question uh from who is this from colette if we can turn on colette's microphone uh she had a question about prayer which i thought was great so colette if you're there and you want to ask it go right ahead can you hear me yep okay sorry it might be a little loud in the background i just wanted to ask about prayer when y'all were talking um i've like been given the um tip that when you're having a moment of desolation whenever it is throughout your day um to to use that time to draw back and like almost force yourself to think of moments of joy of consolation um and i was just wondering if y'all could speak to how to do that um if <laughs> if we should do that how to do that in a way that's not only letting yourself like not be in the now the sacrament of the moment um if that makes sense, like to how, if we are supposed to go back to the constellations, um, how is that not, how can we do that fruitfully? Um, yeah, that would be a great help. Thank you. Yeah, versus, are, are you thinking, Colette, versus um, just being in our heads and focusing on how we feel, but how do we know that that's truly the Lord that's speaking? No, sorry. I, I don't think I'm being too clear, but I think, um, like if, if, so if you're having a moment of desolation and, um, and you're, and so you're told to go back and have a moment, think back to the moments that you have had in the past of consolation. Um, how can I do that? How can we do that fruitfully in a way that's not only dwelling on like the times when Christ has made you laugh or when like good things happened? Um, and how is that not, being um, fake, I yeah. guess, is a good word. I, I have a, a thought, Colette, and I know this is going to be the complete opposite of what you're asking, uh, but it's, I would say, don't go into the consolation. I would say go into the desolation. And, and what I mean by that is that if you read the book of Psalms in the Old Testament, they're absolutely raw with human emotion of just betrayal and agony and, and defeat and just being beat down and lonely and crying out to God, like, where are you in all of this? Why have you forgotten me? My one companion is darkness. And it's so human to be able to cry out to God and brokenness. So you think of Jesus and agony in the garden, you know, he would have been Psalms, just crying out to God from the depths of his heart. I'd once heard that there's a town somewhere in Italy where if a woman's husband dies, she wears black uh, for as long as she wants, a week, a month, a year, she just wears black, basically announcing, hey, I'm not real happy right now. You know, my, my husband died and you get the drift. Okay, she's mourning. That's fine. It, it's a culture where they're allowed to feel what they're feeling. And I think especially in the, the Western part of the civilization, especially in America, you can't feel what you're feeling unless it's good. And if it's a bad or negative feeling, you got to get out of that as fast as possible. But this isn't really, in my sense, a fully human experience. I know a priest once was sharing to me how he once was weeping because of him being unable to have a wife and children. And it went through a period of just authentic mourning. And to me, that was so mature and spiritually healthy that he was able to process those feelings, to feel those, go into those feelings and give them to Jesus Christ instead of just stuffing them for decades until he just blows up and leaves his vocation. And so I would say when you're in that state of desolation, bring that desolation to God in prayer. Find some Psalms from the Old Testament and you'll find that you can really read those from the depths of your heart. And just in the meantime, to just be careful not to seek out false consolations, which will only leave you emptier than you were in the state of original desolation. And obviously not to make any big decisions during a moment of desolation, but I would kind of recommend pray into that, lean into that. Don't try to draw your imagination out by uh, the thought of something happy earlier or in the future. Just be where you are and meet God in that sorrow on that cross. Yeah, I really like your insight, Jason. Uh, I wanted to share something um, Sometimes when, um, when the desolation or the difficult experience we are in, 
is very hard. Uh, and all that we can see is that, that cross, that darkness, that, that desolation. Um, then it's wise to uh, remember the good times with God, uh, to recall them, to even like feel them, like allow yourself to, to like experience them once again, to have the balance, to see that both experiences are real and both, like the, the beauty and the cross is real, that there's not just the cross, but there's also the beauty and, and both are real. Um, yeah, so that, that to keep the balance, not to um, allow the evil spirit also, you know, to work on that and get you into some serious state of, of depression and, and uh, uh, despair even, you know, like, but, uh, but yeah, I, I really like your insight, um, J Jason, and I, uh, I think that the prayer that's very appropriate for every state we are in. Uh, is uh, simply repeating these words, Jesus, I trust in you. Jesus, I trust in you. Uh, I'm in the desolation. I trust in you. You are with me in the desolation. You are with me in the consolation. You are with me always. I trust in you. I trust in you. I trust in you. And um, yeah, everything is real. Like every, we need to experience everything in our lives. And, and everything is good in a sense. Uh, everything is a blessing if we share it with God. That's why I like your insight, Jason, to um, no matter what we are going through, to share it with God, like the psalmist, through psalms, we, we turn to God. We share the experience where we are in with God uh, in honesty. It, it almost reminds me, as one, one other thought, a teenage boy once said to me, he said, whenever I start to have a tempting thought, I try to think about Ross Perot instead. Now, Ross Perot was an elderly politician from like the 1990s, and, uh, and this kid would try to direct his thought over to this old guy. And, uh, you know, I'm like, okay, you know, whatever coping mechanism works there, but to me, there's something better in distraction, and that's immersion of just like, okay, I'm having this tempting thought, meet God there. God, here's my thought. Here's what I'm thinking, you know, to untwist my desires and let's pray for this woman. So you're entering into it instead of trying to bounce away from it um, because it's unpleasant. Uh, you can always meet God where he's at, whether it's consolation, desolation, or somewhere in between. That's great. Yeah. I just remember um, a priest, a very holy priest I knew once said, you know, you can't just empty your heart of, of evil. Uh, it has to be crowded out with the good. Um, and there's so much to that. And there's actually a, a question here that I thought was, was a very good question to clarify uh, from Julia. If she is ready to ask her question, um, it goes along this. Julia, are you there? Are you with us? Yeah. Hi. Thank you guys for hosting this. So my question um revolved kind of around contemplation. So you guys brought that up a few times in your discussions. And can you guys explain a little bit about what contemplation is and how to incorporate that in prayer life? Because I find myself when I'm in silence in prayer or just being still, as you guys said, getting super, super distracted and um, not using that silence um, to encounter God. A great question. <laughs> I'm sure a lot of people have that question. So if anybody wants to jump in. Maybe uh, just briefly, quickly, um, according to the method of, of praying with the word of God, uh, the old, the oldest possible, um, Lectio Divina, contemplation is the last stage of that prayer. So, uh, and, <laughs> well, so what I want to emphasize here, contemplation is not something that we can get like that. Uh, first of all, it's a gift. And it also comes with a, with a time also, with, it, with some kind of experience of our simply prayer for life. It, it comes at a certain stage. Uh, God only knows when. It's not a mathematic, like this kind of, like there's no logic in a sense here. Like that, okay, I will pray for two years, so then I will know how to really enter into contemplation. It is really a gift. and also contemplation just like we were telling about this silent lifestyle recollected lifestyle i think contemplation comes from this so as a result of our whole life uh, lifestyle not only 
the prayer time, but your whole day, uh, if, if your whole day was very chaotic, uh, of course, God's grace can do everything, but on human level, it's almost impossible that you would have like a contemplation at the end, uh, because you will have all those thoughts running through your head. And um, yeah, that's just sharing the first thoughts about it. Hmm? Yeah, I, it's just just right, Julia. I, I think what, what we're saying is it's not something you can kind of gerrymander and just kind of cook up. And when I think about the best relationships in my life and in my experience, it's it's when you are willing to waste time with people. Uh, it, it just um, being raw as a dad, I really dislike the phrase quality time. And, and the reason is this, it, it tends to be often a substitute for quantity of time. Whereas I found those kind of breakthrough conversations, they happen when you're just shooting the breeze. You shoot the breeze long enough, you have fun long enough, and all of a sudden you're in this big conversation, but you can't kind of go from zero to 60 overnight. And I think the same thing with God. Are, are we willing to waste time with him? Are we willing to just be with him? And, and just to, and to not worry so much about the, the method or the mechanics and just, just to, do we, do we believe in him enough? Do we love him enough to waste time with him? And the fruit will, as Jason said, with the sun ray analogy, it, it, it'll, it'll, the, it'll, the payoff is over time. Uh, just like any relationship, but are we willing to waste time with those whom we love? That's very well put. Um, I remember well, one yeah. last thought. I, rem I remember there is a story of a couple, of, a teenage couple that was on a date together at a restaurant, and the whole time they were yapping, 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 and back and forth, and looking over, and there's an elderly couple sitting at the booth across from them that didn't say a word to each other the entire meal. And they look over and then they're, they're yapping, yapping, yapping. And as they're walking out, they kind of like, wow, I really feel sorry for them. They've been to go together so long. They're not even talking to each other anymore. But as they were walking out of the restaurant, they looked and they noticed that the couple was kind of playing footsie with each other underneath the table, the elderly couple. And it's like, look, they've said everything that there is to say. And they're just at peace being with one another. And, and then the younger couple realized that they were not ahead of love of this couple. They had a ways to go before they, you know, could be there. And so to me, that's meditation and contemplation. You know, meditation is, you know, our work with the help of God. Contemplation is, you know, being present and letting God doing his work in us. That's awesome. If I can share one very practical tip. Um, yes. That I basically use uh, each time I start any kind of prayer is to put yourself in the presence of God. Uh, not to start prayer just because, okay, that's the prayer, that's the rosary, that's the whichever kind of prayer I, I do, and just start with amen and hallelujah, and I go for it. No, just give yourself time to put yourself in the presence of God by using any words you, you want. Uh, I love this, this phrase, uh, Lord, I believe you are looking at me right now with great love. Lord, I believe you are looking at me right now with great love. And sometimes that will take most of the time of my prayer, just repeating that, because I feel that I'm not there yet. So it, it takes me a lot of time just to enter the prayer. And then, then the very prayer itself like uh, might be shorter, like the, the very form that I was supposed to pray will be shorter. But, but I really entered into the, the presence of God and I really uh, allowed myself to, to be there with him because prayer is a meeting with him, right? So, yeah, that's that's the practical tip that probably will lead to contemplation with the grace of God, with time and with all the other factors. Yeah, it's so, so important. It's interesting too, you know, we think about what's the number one thing and it just comes down to developing this, this interior life. Um, and, and I'd like to circle back actually to the other point that, um, especially Dr. Swafford and Sister Gaudia had made in the beginning about friendships and about community. Um, we have a number of people who've actually asked questions about, you know, how, how do you form intentional community? Um, you know, when, when society is becoming more secular, uh, maybe uh, Susie here, if you're still on Susie, you had a really great question. Um, that was quite practical. I thought that maybe you'd be able to ask if we can turn Susie's mic on. Um, Susie, are you there with us? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, 
I'm um, really interested. I have a son who just graduated from high school and he was supposed to have his ceremony today. And so people are going back and they have new habits now from the quarantine. Like they might be more on their phone. Um, they might be um, limited into how they can ha meet for mass or how they can meet for classes. There might be smaller classes. Um, given those possible new scenarios, um, they're still doing the same thing that you and I did when we were younger. We did find friends. Um, but, you know, how would you suggest they um, open up these conversations? Any of the speakers, if you want to speak a little bit, because um, there were a number of questions that just talked about here how um, how do you actually deepen a relationship or how did you guys find good friends? Um, you know, so anything about community or friendship and what those friendships look like, what meaningful friendship versus a superficial friendship looks like. I, I would say, go, go ahead. Oh, sister. Sorry. No, I just wanted to, but that's just, just a joke, basically. Uh, encourage everyone to enter religious life. You can find many great friends in the communities. <laughs> Awesome. <laughs> no, that's good stuff. If, if it's a high school student getting ready to head into college, just to get real practical, you need to get in touch with whoever the campus minister is at the university that he's planning to attend. And so before you ever get there, I've had college campus ministers say to me that if they don't see a student within the first week of college, it's unlikely that they will see that person over the next four years years. And so that first week is critical. When they're in that new environment, they're away from home, maybe a little homesick, they tend to just find someone to gravitate to. Maybe it's my buddy who's just in my orientation group, and he becomes my friend, or this roommate I got assigned. He's my friend. That's why they've got to get a game plan before they step foot on that campus. And so I would recommend, look at the Focus.org is the fellowship of Catholic university students. If he's going to a state university or some Catholic ones, look to see if they have representation on that campus through their website. And if they do, you can email them straight through the website and say, look, my kid's showing up in the middle of August. If everything stays on track, um, can we get you hooked up with this guy before we even step? step on campus. If there isn't a focus group, the Newman Center, something like that, you just want to make sure they're getting plugged in because a friend of mine says friends are like elevators. They either take you up and they take you or they take you down. And so the true purpose of friendship is the mutual perfection of the other, that the closer you get to the other, the more you become yourself. False friendships have the opposite effect. The closer you get to them, the further you get from who God is calling you to be. And so I would say, just real practical. In the meantime, get him involved in Life Teen or some local parish youth group and start making the steps for him to be in touch with whoever the campus minister is. So, man, the first weekend at college, he's right there at the barbecue, the tailgate party or whatever, meeting other solid Catholics. Super important. Yeah, and Dr. Swafford, if um, you can add your insights and also maybe give a little bit more about the cultural historical context that John Paul II came from that relates to, to this question as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess my, my first, so amen to what Jason's saying. I cannot, I teach at Benedictine College and, I, and not everybody can, can go to a college like that. It's not always a fit for everybody, but I can't tell you how many times I've heard the story. I never had any Catholic uh, friends in high school and I just found so many in college and whether it's a state school, Newman school focus. Um, so if, if that's the situation right now, just, uh, hit the pause button. It's okay. This is not forever. Uh, you got to put yourself in positions where you can meet those kind of great people. And I'd also say, just like I'd say for dating advice, run to Jesus, run to Jesus. And after you've been really running, look and see who's running with you. And those are going to be your great friends. Um, so currently to your, your question. Um, so with John Paul II, one of the catchwords that we've used around here, Benedictine, uh, and in fact, there's a whole household of uh, students that uh, we're running a house to, and they call themselves the Schroto Visco house. Uh, Strodovisko is a Polish word, as Sister Gadia knows well, that translates as environment or jump a second like milieu. But basically, this was the, the word that was used for um, really kind of a catch of virtuous Christ centered friendship in the midst of communist Poland. Uh, so, early 50s, late 40s, early 50s, when jump a second was a young priest. And 
communism was not just like an economic system. This was a systematic promulgation of atheism, a systematic kind of degradation of the family, of, of sexual morality, of basically a, a kind of a revisionist history of Poland's past and Poland's future. And the battle was over the hearts and souls and minds of the young. Uh, so in this context, what you have is John Paul II forming young people. It goes to St. Florian's, a 29-year-old priest uh, in 1949, and they would go on excursions, kayak, and all those things you've heard. Um, but the thing is, they, they didn't just hang out. And John Paul II wasn't just uh, Ben Caravoiti, he wasn't just a, a buddy with them. Uh, they could talk to him about anything, but he challenged them to greatness. In fact, some of them uh, have said, you know, he wasn't a, quote, buddy. And when I think of being a buddy, I think of my, my own conversion experience, my hardest battles were going back to my high school friends. Uh, and, you know, an off-color joke is told and you give that little nervous laughter. That's being a buddy. So I'd say, um, be your authentic self. Don't, don't, don't hide. Uh, have the courage to be yourself. And what happened with these friendships, in fact, it started with this choir, uh, six of the beginning choir got married to each other. So, you know, this is not why you join a group like that. Uh, but but it, it often is a side effect when people are really on fire and their friendships are about something. And th these friendships stayed together his entire life. And in fact, they, by, by the late 50s, early 60s, they were helping with marriage prep programs with them in the diocese. So it became this um, kind of, where he got to know their kids, their grandkids. Uh, so it's become, uh, if I, I just think briefly, in um, 2018, my family and I, we have a, summer, a study abroad in Florence, Italy. And we had 48 students over in Italy with us. And uh, I taught my class on John Paul II. And we got to take a group over to Krakow. And, and they just fell in love with him. And I started out saying, no, I think you all think highly of him because your mentors spoke highly of him. But I don't think you know the man. And they just fell head over heels in love with him and his story. And Shrodovisco became a, kind of a rallying cry for all of us to take this virtuous, Christ-centered friendship where, where, where people are on fire, they're running, and they're having a great time. I mean, so much joy, so much fun. I mean, I, I, I can't begin to give you the anecdotes of what these uh, five girls, uh, four of them were soccer players in, our, in the house we rented to them. They called themselves the Shrodovisco House. It was a missionary house where people were having such a great time, wholesome fun, lots of joy, but growing in holiness and friendship and just finding a life that was so much more exhilarating than any kind of party culture could ever uh, compare to. So, um, yeah, so short of Visco, um, again, communist Poland was not just an economic thing. Uh, and this became a zone of freedom, of real fellowship, of real communion. Thank you so much. Um, you know, you guys answer that so well. And I'm thinking maybe doing a, at least one, maybe two more questions. Um, a lot of people have a question similar to Sam's question. Sam, if we could turn your microphone on. Um, and you can ask away if you feel bold. Hi, Sam. Hi, um, <laughs> I'm here with my roommate, Abby. So this is actually her question. Um, I oh. just typed it in for her. So Abby, would you like to ask a question? <laughs> yeah, so I was just curious, um, which of JP2's teaching has impacted your guys' life the most? Um. One thing, just to follow up after the last question, Abby, and then I'll answer yours, is that one thing I was thinking as, you know, Dr. Swapper was speaking, if, you, if you're having trouble finding good friends, go to JP2 Project's website and apply there and go off to their missionary program to learn and get formed, and you are guaranteed, honey back, money back guaranteed to find some <laughs> solid Catholic friends. Am I right, Grant? Yeah. So true, true. Yeah, that's that's a surefire way to find some solid friends. But in terms of which of his teachings has impacted me the most, um, I was hooked on John Paul II through his book, Love and Responsibility. And there was a line in there where he said that the word chastity needs to be rehabilitated. And he said chastity can only be thought of in association with the virtue of love. And those two things, the idea that this word needs to be rehabilitated and you can only think of that word in association with the virtue of love has for me become the entire foundation of the ministry that I feel that God has called us to. And so while a lot of people want to kind of stay away from the word chastity, his calling, like, no, this word is beautiful and it needs to be rehabilitated. I've kind of taken that as, as my life's work to try to show the goodness and the truth, but most of all, the beauty of God's plan of human love 
through chastity. And so Theology of the Body has been amazing. But for me, that book, Love and Responsibility, uh, for me, was, was kind of like the gateway drug into all of the hardcore amazing stuff that he has to teach. And so if you haven't read that one, I highly recommend it. So. Sister, do you have do you have something? Oh, sister, that was me. Okay, that's you. <laughs> I was listening. Uh, oh, there's so much. But the the first thing that I remember that stayed with me uh, till today, and and I heard it many many years ago, is when John Paul said, "Do not be satisfied with mediocrity." And I remember these words were like really taking me by the heart like every day of my life somehow you know like just pulling me higher because it was so easy just like jason you gave this example of friends who are like elevators who either take you up or down it was so easy to go down so many times and and i also was always like the most catholic person in my environment and that was difficult and uh i didn't find the strength within me to to pull everybody after me uh, many many challenges in my life before i entered religious life uh, i'm from catholic poland mind you but it's not like a country of only holy people thinking about how to please god all the time uh, especially among young ones uh, but yes john paul always telling me do not be satisfied with mediocrity i always knew that god is calling me for something more and i don't mean success more mean uh, mean a deeper life a more jesus's lifestyle uh, something which is not there available at the reach of your hand when you turn on the computer something which is just more, more challenging and and i just love john paul for that that he was the one who was always challenging yeah do not be satisfied with mediocrity mm. uh, this is such a hard question and, and i i uh echo both what sister and jason are saying I, I think the one thing i think one thing that people don't realize is how much all these things hang together whether it's chastity whether it's this teach on suffering prayer discipleship the holy eucharist so it, it really if you get inside him and none of us can because he's he's a saint and a mystic these are uh outpourings of one life of discipleship uh the, the one thing that i guess that comes to mind now for me though is kind of just a general ethos and the way um he lived his life and conducted ministry from the very beginning. And that's this, this conviction that when you lower the bar for the youth, when you try to water down the gospel, you actually rob them of their chance to be morally heroic. I look back at my, you know, and, and God bless them. And I'm sure I was the one that wasn't listening, but I look back at my kind of early formation, grade school, high school. And, and I see a lot of kind of what Bishop Barron likes to say is beige Catholicism, kind of just kind of a, let's just make it nice and easy. And it really, for me, wasn't until I had the gospel preached with conviction and, and the combination of the challenge of the gospel, but also the infinite mercy of the gospel. Um, it, it, it's, you know, and maybe that was just me at that time, perfect storm, but, but I, I, I've seen it resonate over and over again. And I think I see the fruit of Shirt of Bisco. I see the fruit of him with these young college students it's because he, he gave them something more and he called them to something greater he loved them but he loved them as a father and a father loves his kids just the way they are but too much to leave them that way uh do, he loved people enough to speak the hard truths and he spoke them with love with charity with tact amen but that that kind of ringing challenge of because for me growing up if the gospel is just about being nice i mean confucius could have taught me that plato could have taught me that what difference does jesus make and when jesus becomes lord of your entire life that changes everything so i think uh if in so many ways you could pick so many different teachings but that kind of general ethos of loving enough not to be con you know condemning but loving enough to speak the hard truths that's what changed people's lives. That's what changed my life. And I, I, I see it resonate over and over again. When you lower the bar, conversely, you actually rob people of their chance uh, to pursue sanctity, to, to, to bridge that gap through God's grace from who I am now to who I've been called to be. Yeah, that's great. I'm just thinking um, as far as a, a resource to encounter that message from John Paul II would be his World Youth Day messages or the homilies in World Youth Day um, are directed towards young people and they're so blunt in the challenges um, and, and so beautiful in that way, you know? And, and I, I love that about young people that they have this, and, and the young at heart as well, um, have this innate 
sense for what is authentic. Uh, and, and they can just smell out, you know, when people are real and giving them the truth. And that's why when it hurts, they want to step up to that, even if it's encountering, if it's going against, you know, how they're living or how they're feeling. Um, you're so right. And what's so perplexing about him, I, I, I think from his entire life and, and even now is here you have this thoroughly modern man who is this convicted disciple and this thoroughly cultured, literate, uh, you know, the science, all these things, but yet utterly convicted. And I think that's that, that combination. And I've seen this um, of being of normal, but different where, and there's different ways to evangelize, but, but when uh, I, I, you know, I look at my, um, if I could brag about my kids for a quick second in Florence, I saw my students, you know, my oldest turned 12 over there and it was like, they were normal, but different. It's, there was a bridge, they, they, were, they, they had a little bit of a cool factor, but they were beating to a different drum than your typical 11 year old, 12 year old was. And I, and I think with John Paul II, yeah, there's a normalness to him. Uh, he likes literature, he likes, he's an actor, he's all these things, academic, but wow, there's something different. There's something deeper about him that's not normal. So kind of the normal but different um, is often just this, I think, perennial draw. Yeah, yeah I, I heard one true. priest, uh, I think it was a priest explained by John Paul II, watching his interactions with young people. He said he was happy and demanding. Mm. And that combo is potent, that it's not the grim bearers of the glad tidings, right? You know, it's <laughs> j the joy of the gospel in all of its demands and all of its sacrifices that in the end, this is all good news, even if it demands suffering and death you know, there's resurrection. And so we saw that in John Paul II, you know, a priest who was authentic, loving, and uncompromising all at the same time. So true. Any last, you know, in, in one minute, uh, what would each of you say as, as last, last comments, your last message to young people for this year and encouraging them? Do not be afraid. Open the doors wide to Christ. Yes, I, I believe you. these words, the first words of John Paul II, of the first words of his pontificate, uh, are also so important for us right now when there's so much fear uh, coming to us through all the channels possible, not only through the media, but maybe also within our hearts because the world has changed and we are so uncertain of the future. But what we are certain of always is God's love to us and God's presence with us until the end of time so do not be afraid and just open wide the doors yeah <laughs> open wide the doors of your hearts your, your lives to to god so that he could enter and dwell within you and 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 be with him like allow him to be become your friend he is your friend but just treat him as as your friend uh, yeah do not be afraid yeah i know absolutely if, if i could just echo sister don't be afraid of your past don't be afraid of your past. Let the Lord, uh, when St. Faustine was canonized, as Sister knows, this is John Paul II said, it was one of the happiest days of his life, that divine mercy, the mercy of God was the message that the modern man needed to hear. And to tail off of that, I would say, and don't be afraid of your future. You know, Christ is not coming to imprison you. Uh, he said that every man who seeks the kingdom of God finds himself. And so when we pursue him, sainthood is not about being put into some little holy mold, right? It's, it's the full bloom of the human personality. So we need to trust him, not only with our past and all the mistakes, trust him with all the future and uncertainty you may have. And in the meantime, trust him with your body. There was a, a young person who said to the Holy Father when he was a bishop, how come you talk so much about sexuality? I mean, there's more important matters. And John Paul has said, there's nothing wrong with sexuality in itself, but the abuse of sexuality is the main obstacle to spirituality. And so when it comes to the gift of our sexuality, make sure that you're trusting him with your body because it's the pure in heart who will see God. And so go forward. Don't be afraid to open wide those doors. And as St. John Paul II said to the young people, do not be afraid to become the saints of the new millennium. Amen. So well put. Um, I know there are more questions and you guys would love to hear more, but we have run out of time, but don't be afraid because uh, this weekend, actually, you will have a chance to hear from Jason Everett and Dr. Swafford and a whole ton of other awesome thought leaders and witnesses of the faith in the Love Life Conference that's going on virtually. If you go to chastity.com, you can register there. 
I am registered because I am personally excited for this formation opportunity. I even have the little premium passing because there's no way I can sit in front of a cute computer when I have little children. So I have to just go back to it when I can <laughs> periodically, probably throughout a year. Um, so I encourage everyone to do that. And then if you ever find yourself um, in Washington, D.C., at the National Shrine of John Paul II is where Sister Gaudia is based right now. Um, and she also has these beautiful little video reflections called Evenings with Merciful Jesus um, that we've linked to in the registration page. Um, so you can hear more from her there. Or maybe over in Krakow, if you ever make your way back, sister. Um, you know, the artist that did the mosaics there at the National Shrine is the same one who did the mosaics in the John Paul II Sanctuary and the center. With, oh, right here. This yes, the Marco Rubik. Students Rubik. painted sure this. It. This is our little yeah. home. Um, yeah. And that is where we have our, our residence for all of our programs. So to study abroad or do pilgrimage, whether you're high school to young family, um, I definitely invite you, if you haven't already been abroad with us, um, to um, come and immerse yourself in his teachings and examples. And yeah, definitely a good friend is totally guaranteed. I'm sure all of our alumni there are nodding their heads, the ones that are there. Um, so I invite you to participate and yeah, just to really live out this, this year in holiness and know that we are praying for each and every one of you. And I'm just so excited for what the Lord has in store for you. Even if I never meet you and never get to see you, um, in heaven, I, I, I want to see these fruits. So um, God bless you all. And thank you so much. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you so much to our speakers and your time this evening. Thank so, you, everyone. And God bless you all. God bless. Happy birthday, JP2. Happy birthday. <laughs>